Welcome back to the Social Network Show. This is a special edition of the show. We're happy to have Melissa Watson with us from freethegirls.org. And we had just been talking about expanding the program whereby you provide an inventory of gently used bras to women who are in a halfway house or or some kind of uh, intermediate living arrangement after they've been freed from sexual exploitation, uh, usually through sex traffickers. In other words, they've basically been made slaves. Uh, so you had, uh, Kimba had mentioned that you were expanding into some other countries. You have Dave in Mozambique. What is happening new uh, on the frontier here? So we are expanding this year into three locations in Uganda. And one in El Salvador. And then in 2014, we're looking to expanding into Kenya. So some of those, um, those are aftercare programs or safe houses that um, take women in, but they need those women to be employed. So we're really getting the bras there, the launch of the program, mm -hmm. because until they have that, they can't even promise those positions um, to women to come into their program. Mm. So they, uh, this is has become part and parcel of the of, of the overall program of their programs too. Uh -huh. Their existing programs, but they won't take in um, additional women. Like, for example, there's some women who uh, were trafficked, and they are actually in Asia. And in order to be repatriated into Uganda, so to come back to their own country where mm -hmm. they were taken from, and to be accepted by one of these safe houses, they have to have gainful employment waiting for them or the safe houses can't take them in. It works a little different than what we think uh -huh. of safe houses in this country. And so part of that is getting the Uganda program going and then those women will be able to come back to their own country. It, it seems wow. incredible to us that we wouldn't accept our own citizens back to our country, but that's sort of the um, status you have in, mm -hmm. in the international scene of, right. uh, as a victim of trafficking. Huh. Well, I'm sure glad that there's that on the horizon, uh, some and a, an additional way you can work toward the good of people who have been victimized. And the, um, the arrangements for the, the various countries, um, is, is the sale of bras pretty much the same in all these different countries? It's a little bit different, and as we expand into Uganda, particularly, it's different. They have laws in Uganda which prohibit the importation of used undergarments. So it, to them, it, regardless of clean or not clean or whatever, they have determined that they're going to prohibit the, the importation of that. So all of the bras that we are shipping into Uganda have to be new inventory. Oh. And those are coming from partners that we're making within the um, garment industry, particularly lingerie, um, retailers, mm -hmm. manufacturers, distributors, um, store, and e the stores, uh, all the way up to the manufacturers, have been great supporters in that. And and in in October, we'll be making our first shipment of new bras outside out to Uganda. Now that maybe ties in somewhat with the reason you're here in Las Vegas, and we're able to interview you in person. Yes, I am here attending a lingerie trade show making mm -hmm. contacts with, um, again, just those people within the lingerie industry, um, letting them know what we have to offer and really offering them a way to, they have a problem which is overstock inventory, surplus inventory of, of kind of irregular amounts and sizes. And we will take all of that off their hands. It provides them a way of, of donating it to us, getting a tax advantage. They don't have to look for another way to unload it. And then in our program, that allows us to have that inventory that we need to keep that program supplied with bras. Because the worst thing we could do is start a program, get all these girls out there working, and then when they come back to buy inventory, you know, six months, nine months down the road, and we don't have inventory for them. So we have to, we are working on that ongoing supply of inventory, not just used inventory, which we find social networks have taken care of sort of making that very easy for us to get that gently used inventory, but now the new inventory mm -hmm. for these countries that require us to have new inventory to go into their countries. Now, one thing I noticed in your material on freethegirls.org, which has a, it's a very nice comprehensive website, oh. well, that it brings up the idea that you don't continually provide an inventory for free to the people that are using this um, as their startup, you might say, for their business in selling 
uh, reselling bras. And I kind of like that. Can you explain the rationale behind that? Well, they're truly learning um, a skill set, which is running this business. And like any business, you would buy your inventory and then mark it up and sell it. And that's how you make your profit. And you use some of that profit to buy more inventory. So that w- it, it really is no different in our program, though the inventory is much less expensive to buy. But when they start in the program, their initial inventory is free. Mm-hmm. We provide that to them so they can start their micro enterprise, their own business. And then they come back to buy inventory. It's pennies on the dollar. But it it allows them that process of what it really is to run a business, that it's not just being handed out to you. You're working for it. You have to budget back. And, and they're still making good money. Most of the girls in our Mozambique program make three to five times the m- local minimum wage. And that's mm-hmm. awesome because it means they they not only escape this life of poverty and complete uh, you know terror, but now they're living well. Mm-hmm. And of course, I, I think that's um, probably may sound a little bit even better than it is because when you consider that these women are basically starting from nothing. They don't have a household. They don't have a, the the clothes that they had f- two years ago or three yeah. years ago. Or just, um, <laughs> I, I can relate to this because when I came back from overseas, it was sort of like, wow, you just didn't have any idea how many things that you took for granted when you didn't have a household for a while. And, and when I say living well, I don't want anybody to think that they have a, you know, three bedroom, two bathroom home. They're mm-hmm. living well for them is they can have a, a brick home instead of a stick home. Still dirt floors. Still doesn't have a running water. Doesn't have sewer. Um, has a thatched roof. But for them, having a house that won't won't wash away in the rainy season means a house built of brick, and it's you know maybe a couple hundred square feet, and there may be themselves, their children, some of their siblings, um, a boyfriend or a husband, so that, you know, you may have eight people living in 200 square feet, one room house. So it's living well there is a little bit different than living well here. That brings up a question that had entered my mind on this is how many of the women have children from the their their clients, although it's their um Empl- their owners, clients, you might say, if they're in prostitution, um, how many of them come into the program with uh, a child or more? Yeah, many women come into the program with a child or come into the program because they're pregnant, and that is their wake-up call for getting out and wanting to say, I, I have a child now, I'm go- or I'm going to have a child, and I want a better life for that child. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes that is actually the catalyst for getting them to an aftercare program, Safe House, and from there, then being introduced to Free the Girls as a means of, of employment so that they can stay away from being on the streets and not go back to the streets. Because even if they don't have a, a pimp anymore, uh-huh. um, that's the only life they know. It's the only skill set they have. And and uh, it's hard to find employment when you've been uh, victimized since you were a preteen uh, mm-hmm. to say that you have you could just get out of it and go work at McDonald's. I, that's, that's, that's a little bit different, uh, especially in a developing country. Right. I would a- ask, too, that, that the biggest challenge for them, then, is like, in a way, it's just a completely new lifestyle. They, they have to learn how to run a business. The interesting thing, too, it seems, is that they can set an example for their kids or for yes. their peers. So if they're actually making, say, three times or four times more than the, the minimum there, um, this can really help the economy, I would imagine, in these poor developing countries. Am I right? I, I would say yes. They're becoming part of that economy instead mm-hmm. of, um, I wouldn't, it's, they don't have a welfare system, so it's not that they're a suck on their economy, but the opposite of it is just continuing in a in a life that is is harmful for both them and their children and certainly um, working as a prostitute and being forced to work as a prostitute you're victimized daily and not just by one person but many person and I know Dr. Jane said clients but really Johns are just as much perpetrators as pimps Mm. Uh, they're just as much a part of the problem 
and we tend to have some forgiveness even in our just the way we think about prostitution as a society for all, for all of those players in it and it's not a choice and it's not the oldest profession it's the oldest form of victimization of women <laughs> in the world is what it really is <laughs> right it cannot be called a victimless crime and when you're talking about women and and women isn't even the word when you're talking about girls who are 10 and 12 years old um, they, they didn't make that choice. No child wakes up and says, I want to have sex with, you know, seven men a night mm-hmm. and I want to be raped and, and I want to be beaten. That It's not a choice. Have you had any uh, feedback from the girls, uh, their stories now? Like, how long has it been going? It's, you say three years now? Since 2010. Okay. Are we getting feedback? Are you getting Actually, feedback? Actually, one of the best compliment you can get from a girl in the program is when she tells you that she's found a job. And so we did actually just recently, we we're telling a story about a girl in the program named Joanna who who found a job outside of selling bras, although she continues to sell bras on the side to supplement her income. She was able to get a job at a local restaurant. And part of that was being able to have money to buy some clothes to wear to the interview. And and then she had a skill set to say, you know, I, I've run a business. I've given change. I know how to manage money and inventory. So although they may come back and saying, you know, I'm sorry, I'm quitting. I have another job. That's actually a compliment mm-hmm. to say that they found another job and they've, they're mm-hmm. able to move on with w- in a way that they couldn't before for the girls. Mm-hmm. Cool. And that running a business, I um, remember a woman I knew that had gone to the market in the morning, as usual, to buy what, uh, this was in West Africa, not East, but um, I think certain things are, are the same the world over, and the societies where you buy food every day for that day, and she got home, she couldn't find the little red peppers that she had bought to put in the stew, and the Piedmont, and uh, so she continued going and making the meal, but wondered where on earth could they have gone. And she happened to look out her front door, and here her four-year-old was out front at the sidewalk with a little table and little piles of Piedmont selling them to the passers-by. <laughs> oh, that's classic. All right. Yeah. So being a uh, businesswoman is something that is uh, very much a uh, uh, a normal part of African society. Uh, we'll be back nice. with a, uh, some more stories, I hope, um, and some more insights as to how we can help, what is involved in having a broad drive, and how uh, the, the material gets to the people that need it. So thank you, uh, Melissa Watson from freethegirls.org.